through scripture readings for today is 2 Samuel chapter 9. David asked, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David. The king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. The king said, Is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, show the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, There remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Micar, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Micar, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Mephibosheth, Sheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, I am your servant. David said to him, do not be afraid, for I show you the kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and to you yourself shall eat at my table always. He did obeisance and said, What is your servant? What you should look upon a dead dog such as I? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to his house I have given to your master and grandson. You and your sons and servants shall shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat but your master's grandson Mephibosheth may always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Good job, youth group. Especially with pronouncing those words. Gave that to you on purpose, just saying. <laughs> so I want to start this morning by telling you a story about something that broke my heart. And it's something that I've shared with you before, but um, it continues to preach just like the Word of God continues to preach to us. There was a church that I served and that I love deeply to this day, a Baptist congregation where I served in youth ministry. And in this congregation, there were a couple of teenage girls whose mother, her name is Mary, was going to seminary and she wanted to be ordained because in the Baptist church, um, very similar to the United Church of Christ, the congregation does the ordaining. And so, Mary came forward to be ordained, but all of a sudden, the church had a problem. The church where Mary and her family had found a home for the last 13 years, they were suddenly divided over whether to ordain Mary because Mary was gay. And so, because of this divided uh, nature, the church said, well, we've got to work this out. And so they did so by holding these town hall meetings. And there was a microphone placed in there at the front, and people would one by one go up to the front, and they would begin to make their case. And the more they made their case, the more it became apparent that we weren't in dialogue. We were having a debate. And the more we debated over whether to ordain Mary into the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the fact, the hang-up being her sexual orientation, the more people took offense at the other side's position, and the less we saw each other as followers of Christ, the less, we, the less we saw each other as members of the same family, and the more we would speak 
to and about one another with disdain. It broke my heart. But what broke my heart, I want to be clear about this, it wasn't that the church was unwilling to unanimously to ordain Mary. That disappointed me greatly. But what broke my heart was this treatment of one another. It was how the church treated each other so poorly with such unapologetic and outright disdain. At least that's the way that it came across. Simply because what was really at issue is our fear of losing power. They feared change. That change being that if Mary were to be ordained, things wouldn't be the way they used to be. Ordaining Mary would mean that, for one thing, the Baptist General Convention of Texas would kick us out. We'd no longer have an affiliation with that historically powerful Baptist entity in our Lone Star State. Ordaining Mary would mean that we would probably lose church members, which means, of course, that we would lose their giving. There'd be that much less money and volunteerism for our institution that requires both to survive. And ordaining Mary would mean that people unaccustomed to and unfamiliar with lesbians sharing their space in any out-of-the-closet capacity with them, they would now be subjected to a lesbian preaching about God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And while the church held these town hall meetings where one by one church members would approach a microphone and chastise our pastor, saying with him in the room that it was a mistake to have called him to be pastor in the first place, and while they'd give each other ultimatums, if this happens, I'm going to take it personally and I'm going to leave. And while they'd even put Mary herself on trial, asking her questions about her character and her temperament and her, and her decision making that would never be asked of a straight male person requesting to be ordained in private or in public. While this is going on, Mary's two teenage daughters and their youth group peers sat in a corner of the room with these saddened looks on their faces, stunned that the adults that they looked up to could treat each other like this. And I, their youth minister, looked at the youth group and I wondered how many of them would leave the church after graduating from high school never to return because of this memory that they now had scraped into their brains of the church being so afraid of losing power that it lost sight of Jesus and his insistence on peace. Fear of losing power has led to institutional violence for centuries, but it comes to a brief halt in this story that we hear today from 2 Samuel, where David shows kindness to his former foe's family. King Saul has died, and now David is on the rise and assumed to be the one who will take control. Sam Cooke is singing in the ears of everyone throughout Jerusalem and Judah. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change gonna come. Oh, yes it is. Can't avoid it. And so Saul's kingdom, his military officers, and his entire family lineage... They go after David and his people with murder and violence. And even though David is a good guy, the one whom God favors, David responds to violence with violence, wiping out the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the Philistines until no one is left from all this bloodshed that was started for no other reason than a kingdom's fear, an institution's fear of losing power. Now that might be what we do in Game of Thrones, but this is not what we do in the kingdom of God. So when the smoke has cleared from all this unapologetic outright violence, David hits the pause button and asks, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness? And there is. Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth. And once Mephibosheth is identified, all David has to do is wipe him out. 
And as Emperor Palpatine would say, his journey to the dark side would be complete. <laughs> but he chooses instead to restore his land to him and to even invite him into his home, into his kingdom, to eat at his table with him. And a table, let's be reminded, is where everyone is equal. Imagine if all of our world's kingdoms and institutions would do this. It's an act of humility and kindness that makes room for forgiveness and reconciliation, and it leads to peace. But since it appears that that's not what's going to happen anytime soon in our world, let's start with this institution. Let's start with this family of faith that is not identified by a building, but by the people, as we say. Let's start by heeding Philip Gully's suggestion, if the church were Christian, peace would be more important than power. And let's understand something about today's story of peacemaking. Did you catch how in the scripture reading it mentions twice that Mephibosheth is lame in his feet? Did you catch that? That's important. There's a reason for that. See, here's what transpires a couple of chapters earlier in 2 Samuel. Hear these words. David and his men marched to, Jer to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here. Even the blind and the lame will turn you back, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. David had said on that day, Whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, whom David hates. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around, and David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Translation, and pulling no punches, David hated people with disabilities. And why? Because they threatened his power. But then he, used, he uses that power to repent, to bring the margins to the middle, and to make peace. Where his kingdom once excluded persons with disabilities, now they ate at the same table as the king. They ate together. The church should take a lesson from this in making peace more important than holding on to power. While those with disabilities remain the most excluded, overlooked group of people in our country, the church would do well to give up being fearful authoritarians in order to make room for the authority of Christ Jesus, who teaches us to live without fear, and who says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. For centuries, the church's authoritarianism has, and that insistence on knowing the right way and having a monopoly on the purest morals and values, that's overshadowed the authority of Jesus, the peacemaker, which has left persons with disabilities and LGBTQ people and so many others outside the walls of a kingdom that it appears is now crumbling under its own fear. Gully has some advice for us here. He says, churches should, in a very real way, be laboratories of peace, modeling the principles of reconciliation among ourselves, then inviting and equipping the world to do the same. Don't we see how just as David was inescapably bound to Mephibosheth, we are undeniably bound to one another. We can't have peace until we give up our fears about change and about losing power and we recognize this urgent truth. As we talked about last week, the salvation of the world that God so loves depends on this urgent truth. Starbucks gets it. Have you seen their new cup? It's a drawing of a lot of different people. How many of you guys are going to go to Starbucks after the worship service now? It's a drawing of a whole bunch of different people, and it's drawn entirely with one line. That's the point. 
Okay? The symbolism is how we're interconnected rather than divided despite the current political climate of our country. It's Starbucks' attempt to bring our world more together, one pumpkin spice latte at a time. <laughs> Look at Starbucks being a laboratory for peace. Starbucks. Shouldn't we be doing that same thing in here? Modeling the principles of reconciliation among ourselves, then inviting and equipping the world to do the same, one act of love at a time? A few weeks ago when I was teaching the high school Sunday school class, I gave the group a quick assignment. We were talking about how, as Christians living in a capitalist society, we deal with this constant tension where money is power. But Jesus calls us to be peacemakers and to place peacemaking over and above power. In other words, in our context, to place people over money. And so I asked the group to write down what they would do if they were to suddenly, out of the blue, receive an enormous amount of money. And these are just a few of the things that they wrote down. I would help loved ones out of poverty. I would help poor trans people. I would give to LGBTQ charities. I would give to movements working for change for the better. I would set some of it aside for my children. I would support a whole village or community. I would give to education. I would make food available for others, including fresh water. I would buy clothes and toys for impoverished, impoverished children. I would put some away to build up, but to then give away in the end to charities. I would travel to understand the world. I would stop college debt. I would buy Walmart and raise the minimum wage. <laughs> I would rescue all the cats from all the shelters. I would establish my own charities to ensure quality care. I would fund green programs for cheap, easy distribution. I would pay for water treatment systems in impoverished areas. I would pay people to make grocery stores in our country's food deserts. I would pay people to farm. I would make a market for agriculture. I would give to the church. This is what our young people are learning in this laboratory for peace. This is what they want to do with their lives and what they want to do in this world. And hearing from them, it mends my broken heart. And it sets it on fire. It makes me want to follow their lead and use my discipleship with Christ to make their vision for the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven a reality. Even if following that lead, lead means that I lose some of the power, some of the comforts, that I have appreciated about the church in the past along the way. Gully writes, we cannot just go on decrying the hypocrisies of our time like sheep getting together at annual meetings to pass resolutions against the wolves. No matter how often we say whereas and therefore, the world is changed not by those who condemn, but by those who act. In other words, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In the end, the church never took a vote as to whether to ordain Mary. Some felt that they'd dodged a bullet. Others were heartbroken. Instead, she withdrew her request and went to another Baptist church that happened to be a mission church of the church that was hesitant to ordain her. And Church of the Savior readily ordained Mary and then called her to be their, their pastor. It was like a child being told by their parents, stay away from that strange lesbian, she's bad news, and then the child dates the lesbian and they live happily ever after. <laughs> I'm thinking of my friend Mary this week because just a few days ago, she traveled to North Dakota to stand with more than 500 clergy from across the country who were summoned there to stand with the water protectors of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe and their allies in opposition to the construction of a pipeline that will obstruct sacred burial grounds and the water supply of indigenous people there. And Mary posted a picture on Facebook from what she saw there. And she wrote this. Here is what the water protectors want 
to protect the beautiful Missouri River. It was truly a peaceful moment as I stood on the banks away from everything and everyone. It is worth protecting. I can't help wondering as the world looks on at such fearless peacemakers in North Dakota, in Ferguson, to what causes, efforts, and movements will the cloud of witnesses of this day and age give their allegiance, their time, talent, and treasure, their hearts, minds, and their very lives? Will it be to the institutions who prioritize power over peace, or those that place peace over and above power, no matter what the cost? Shall we pray? Gracious God, protector of our life and land, equip and empower us, we pray, to be co-creators with you as we are made in your divine image to protect one another and the earth we share. Encourage us, we pray, to live faithfully and fearlessly in our walk with Jesus Christ so that peace would be more important to us than power and so that your church would thrive through your people both within the walls of this institution that we love and beyond it. Amen.